All right, good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. Father, we come before you this morning grateful for your word and the work it does in our hearts to transform us into Christ's image. Uh, we need that, Lord, because sin was brought into this world and with sin came death. And so we know that, Lord. We're thankful for Christ's victory over sin and death. Death is probably, uh, at, least, at the least, confusing to us. At best, something we despise talking about and thinking about. If there's any part of death that's most confusing, it is probably the death of, of babies. I know we could even sometimes question uh, why you'd allow that. And so I pray, Lord, that this would be a time of equipping. I'm not, I see it more as a time of, uh, of teaching for us to have the resources to understand why babies, when they die, do go to heaven. And so help us, Lord, even if uh, not just to be encouraged for our own lives, but to be able to encourage others when they come to us. I can't imagine a more difficult question as a pastor than that I would receive from parents who just lost a child. I've been in that situation before, Lord, and I'm thankful that by your word I can provide them with the scriptures that teach that uh, that child uh, has gone to heaven and that they will see that child in heaven someday as well, Lord, assuming that they've repented and put their faith in Christ. And so I pray for the church to be equipped also, Lord, for any times that they might experience, anyone here would experience a miscarriage or worse, the loss of of a child who has been born, but also just to be equipped to minister to those people that they would encounter in those situations. We thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for your word. Pray that you give us understanding. We'll be looking at lots of verses this morning, uh, which is not the way we typically go through your word, and so just help us to grasp the different portions we look at, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, good to see all of you. The title this morning's sermon is, Are Children Innocent? Our children innocent. And so, as you know, if you worship with us regularly, we've been going through Luke's gospel verse by verse on Sunday mornings. We are still doing that in a sense. We've reached some verses that are some of the strongest in scripture about infants going to heaven. It's when the disciples tried to push the children away. Jesus said, Let the children come to me. And he declared that the Bible belongs not just to, or excuse me, he declared that the kingdom of God belonged not just to children, but to those like children. And that's really one of the strongest declarations in Scripture about babies being saved or being able to go to heaven. <clears throat> so getting some momentum into those verses, we're going to take a week or two laying a foundation that helps us understand why Jesus made that statement. So instead of jumping right into the statement Jesus made, we're going to have one or two weeks looking at why Jesus made that statement. I'll share an observation about this topic, about babies going to heaven. Many people's beliefs about this or about babies going to heaven is born more out of wishful thinking or sentimentality than out of Scripture itself. In other words, we all want to believe babies go to heaven. We would probably say that it seems right to us for babies to go to heaven. But the question isn't really, do we think babies go to heaven or does it seem right that babies go to heaven? What is the question we should ask? Does the Bible teach that babies go to heaven? Exactly. And this brings us to lesson one. The Bible teaches, the Bible teaches that babies part one go to heaven. Just lay that thesis out right here at the beginning. The Bible does teach the babies, part one, go to heaven, which I believe will become clearer <clears throat> over this sermon and the next two. So I want you to know right at the very beginning that even though I personally want to believe that babies go to heaven, and I've never met anyone who would believe otherwise, and it does seem right to me intuitively or naturally that babies would go to heaven, that is not why I believe babies go to heaven. I believe they go to heaven because that's what the Bible teaches. If you've ever experienced a miscarriage before, then I don't want you wondering what happened to your child and whether you will see that child again. I don't want you having to say things like, I believe my baby is in heaven because that's what so many people have told me. I don't want you having to say, I think my baby is in heaven because the alternative is simply too horrific to think about. Instead, I want you saying, I know my baby is in heaven because that's what the Bible teaches. 
Now, if you sit here today as a young person, you face the very real possibility of experiencing a miscarriage or miscarriages. For, for many of us, uh, we've experienced multiple miscarriages. We've experienced four, we believe. But even if by God's grace, you're never forced to experience a miscarriage, you are going to encounter people who have experienced miscarriages or have even lost a child after that child has been born. And few things cause people as much heartache as that experience. And I would go so far as to say few things cause people to doubt or question God's goodness as much as the loss of a child. And so I want Ephesians 4.12 says, my primary responsibility is equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And so I just want to invite you to see this sermon and the subsequent sermons as a time of equipping. I want you equipped, not just to minister to yourself. We do have to talk to ourselves at times. We have to tell ourselves scripture when we go through trials. We need to remind ourselves of the promises in God's word and what God wants to, or not wants to, but is doing through the trials that we are experiencing if we lose a child we need to talk to ourselves preach to ourselves so i hope to equip you to be able to preach these truths or these verses to yourself but i also want to equip you to be able to share these verses with with others sometimes people have come to me and said well pastor scott this person asked me this question and i didn't know how to respond well what tougher question could you receive than why did my baby die can you imagine a more difficult question to receive from someone than why did my baby die? Am I going to see that baby again? What happened to my baby after he or she died? Well, I want you to be able to answer those questions. I want you to be able to comfort these people, not with cliches and platitudes, but with a biblical defense for their baby's salvation. And so when parents say something like, how do I know I will see my child again? I want you to be able to point to these verses. We're going to go through a lot of verses, and if you don't get to write all of them down or you can't remember all of them, you will see them on your bulletin and you can look them up later. Now, one final point before I begin. Everyone, believer or unbeliever alike, receives a resurrection body. We Believers and unbelievers receive resurrection bodies. Nobody is going to spend eternity in these physical or earthly bodies that we inhabit right now. I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is not the main point of the sermon, but here are a few verses making the point that these earthly bodies are much different than our resurrection bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 42, Paul says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown, referring to our earthly bodies, is perishable. What is raised, referring to our resurrection bodies, is imperishable or eternal. It referring to our earthly bodies as sown in dishonor, it referring to our resurrection bodies as raised in glory, it referring to our earthly bodies as sown in weakness, it referring to our resurrection bodies as raised in power, our earthly bodies are sown a natural body, our resurrection bodies are raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural or earthly body, there's also a spiritual or resurrection or eternal body. So we can tell that there are these considerable differences between our earthly bodies and our resurrection bodies. Now, from what I've learned, whether reading or listening to sermons, most scholars agree that we're not going to spend eternity at the same age we die unless we die probably close to our 20s or 30s. So let me say it like this. Most scholars don't believe that our resurrection bodies are going to be the same age as our earthly bodies assuming you die at a very old age or if someone was to die at a very young age. And so what I mean by that, if someone was, let's say, in their 90s or a centennial, when they die, they're not going to spend eternity looking like a 90-year-old or like a centennial. So for lack of a better way to say it, what age are we going to look for eternity? Well, if I had to guess, I would say probably the age that Adam and Eve were when they were created. That was an, and we know a few things they were able to do. They were able to work, they were able to take care of themselves, they were able to procreate. So I would say probably around 20s or 30s. Hopefully that's an attractive age 
to you, and you like to hear that you'll get to spend eternity looking like a 20 or or 30-year-old. Now, what does this have to do with this sermon? If a baby dies, the baby does not spend eternity looking like a baby, any more than that 90-year-old spends eternity looking like a 90-year-old. The 90-year-old receives that resurrection body to look like a 20 or 30-year-old. The baby receives a resurrection body to look like a 20 or 30-year-old. So here's my point. We despise the thought of babies going to hell, but there's a sense in which it's an impossibility for a baby to go to hell. Because the moment that a baby dies, that baby no longer looks like a baby. That baby will spend eternity looking like an adult. And so again, my point is we cannot hold to sentimental or philosophical arguments or wishful thinking about babies going to heaven or hell because, in a sense, babies couldn't even go to hell anyway because they would, in the twinkling of an eye or at that last trumpet or in that moment, have a resurrection body for eternity. With that, we're ready to begin with an understanding of innocence. Adam and Eve were created during what's commonly called the dispensation. We're dispensationalists here, and we would say that Adam and Eve were created during what's called the dispensation of innocence. Now, we say that Adam and Eve were innocent because they had not sinned yet, but we also say that Adam and Eve were innocent in a sense, in a somewhat naive sense, because they couldn't choose between good and evil yet. So we say they're innocent because they hadn't sinned, but we also say they're innocent because they couldn't yet choose between good and evil. And what did God, wanted, what did God want to do with Adam and Eve's innocence? He wanted to preserve it. So look with me in Genesis 2.16. Wanting to preserve Adam and Eve's innocence or even naivety regarding good and evil, in Genesis 2.16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, If every tree of the garden you may freely eat... But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat from the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And I just want you to notice, because I know we're very familiar with this, we could read over it quickly. This is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I just want to ask you something. Does this sound like a very immoral or evil tree to eat from? Let's be honest. I don't think so. It's not called the tree of doing bad things. And when you eat it, you suddenly do a bad thing. It just doesn't sound very bad to eat from this tree. And so think about what this means. As long as Adam and Eve did not eat from this tree, they would not have the knowledge of good and evil. And think about what that means. As long as Adam and Eve did not eat from this tree, they would not have to choose between good and evil. Now, how wonderful would that be? to be able to live in that innocent dispensation had they not eaten. The one verse demonstrating their innocence or demonstrating that they did not recognize good and evil or have the knowledge of good and evil is Genesis 2.25. So go ahead and look there with me. The man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. So they had so little knowledge of good and evil, they did not even know there was something wrong with being naked. Now, this is interesting to read. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. It is very interesting to read that Adam and Eve could be naked and unashamed or not experience shame because there are about 10 verses in Scripture associating shame with nakedness. In other words, to be naked is to experience shame. And just here's three verses. Micah 1.11, pass on your way in nakedness and shame. Nahum 3.5, behold, I'm against you, declares the Lord of hosts. I'll lift up your skirts over your face. I'll make nations look on your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. Revelation 3.18, Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Now, what's even more interesting is if I was to give you even more verses about the association between nakedness and shame, they're all said to wicked people. But what's my point with that? My point is wicked people who are typically not accustomed to experiencing shame, like godly people, 
still experience shame associated with nakedness which is why it's very surprising that we could read genesis 2 25 and see that adam and eve were naked yet experiencing no shame so let's understand what creates shame we can understand genesis 2 25 if we understand how shame is created and to put it simply shame is created by the knowledge of doing something wrong or doing something evil a few examples have you ever entered someone's home and you didn't know they take off their shoes and you're walking around their house with your shoes on and then what and you don't feel ashamed and then what do they say hey we're just letting you know when we come in the house we take our shoes off and then suddenly you feel ashamed even though you didn't er earlier because now you recognize you're doing something wrong i have been speeding before and i put my phone up on this little thing that show you know uh, allows my kids behind me in the car or in the bus to see my phone and if, when the map is on you can also see the speed you're going and so i won't feel bad or ashamed of how fast i'm going to one of my children looks at my phone and says what hey daddy you're speeding and at that moment i feel ashamed that my children are more righteous than i am and apparently not concerned about us potentially being late to whatever we're attending have you ever started eating this is the worst you're eating it's delicious huge amount of food in your mouth and then someone says what let's pray and you're like you try to you close your eyes and you try to put your face down like this so nobody sees your cheeks puffed up with the food you try to swallow very well you weren't ashamed you didn't feel ashamed you're actually feeling joy because the food is so good and then you feel ashamed when you recognize you've done something wrong so the point is we feel shame when we know we did evil but because adam and eve had not eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they had no knowledge that what they were doing was evil and think about this for a moment this is interesting most of what god commands us not to do we know is evil so we know we shouldn't do it like just think about it there are many things in the bible we don't need the bible to tell us are wrong we can go to places in the world that the bible has not reached yet or the gospel hasn't been preached and those people because of their consciences which we'll probably talk about next week still know that it's wrong to lie cheat and steal or murder or commit adultery we don't need the bible to tell us those things are wrong our conscience tells us those things are wrong but because adam and eve did not yet have knowledge of good and evil when god said not to eat from the tree it is an incredible example of having to walk by faith or we we sing the hymn trust and obey adam and eve truly had to trust and obey because they couldn't tell that it was wrong to eat from this tree they had no knowledge of it other than what god said they had to walk by faith and simply trust him now satan comes along and undermines their trust in god look in genesis 3 verse 5 satan says god knows that when you eat of it your eyes will be opened and you will be like god knowing good and evil now i'm gonna ask you a trick question isn't it nice i tell you whether it's a trick question or not this is a trick question was god or was satan telling the truth in verse 5 in genesis 3 5 was satan telling the truth he was telling the truth this was true as you've probably heard before satan deceives people not by frequently telling outright lies but by telling what lies mixed with an amount of truth which is why i would say that the greatest threat to christians or christianity is not typically hinduism or buddhism but those cults jehovah's witnesses or mormons or those religions that most christian science or most closely resemble christianity or those cults that have an amount of truth mixed in with the lies so when adam and eve ate they experienced the truth that satan said to them he told them that their eyes would be opened they would be like god i mean this is what he said look in genesis 3 5 it's so truthful what he said your eyes will be opened you will be like god and they were like god in this sense you will know good and evil when you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil look at verse 6 when the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was a delight to the eyes 
the tree was to be desired to make one wise she took its fruit and ate gave some to her husband who was with her he ate verse 7 just like satan said the eyes of both of them were opened they knew that they were naked they saw the evil of it they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves loincloths and this brings us to lesson two we will come back to lesson one lesson two adam and eve's innocence was lost when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil adam and eve's innocence was lost when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so just like say and this is why we frequently talk about innocence lost right just like satan said their eyes are open they developed the knowledge of good and evil they knew that it was wrong to be naked the new living translation which i don't highly recommend because it's more of a thought for thought translation or dynamic equivalence versus a word for word translation which i prefer but still the nlt says they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness so immediately it's like they're told we take our shoes off or let's pray or you're speeding they experience shame so they clothe themselves look at verse 11. god says who told you that you were naked have you eaten of the tree of which i commanded you not to eat god did not ask this because he was wondering i'm not making a joke god knew the answer to this why did he ask this well i'll tell you he asked it for the same reason when you know your kids have done something wrong and you ask them what they did so that they have the opportunity to do what confess right he's given them the opportunity to confess and be truthful god knew the only way that they could know that there was something wrong with being naked and that they needed to clothe themselves was if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so their innocence is lost so this marks regarding dispensationalism this marks the end of the dispensation of innocence and now begins the dispensation of conscience which we'll talk more about next week adam and eve's innocence is lost consciences have been given to them now they have knowledge of good and evil and let's connect this to babies if you think about babies you can picture their innocence you can see the ways that babies resemble adam and eve you can see a baby's innocence and the way they don't have knowledge of good and evil there's a sense in which adam and eve or babies greatly resemble adam and eve prior to the fall babies do not experience shame and like some of you might have already been thinking and i'm not making a joke babies feel no shame associated with being naked you know when they're being changed they never look up at you and say hey stop looking at me you know this is embarrassing i I don't want to look like this if you let children or babies they'd run around your house you know if they could could they'd be naked all day and never feel ashamed of that not only do they not experience shame associated with nakedness they don't experience shame associated with anything have you ever seen a baby ashamed of something have you ever seen a baby eating making a huge mess of themselves and everything around them and there's suddenly a moment when have you ever heard babies don't eat food they wear it (laughs) if you don't know what i'm talking about you just don't know babies or you haven't had a baby or been around them there's never you know we've had nine children now there's never been a time one of our babies was in the high chair making a humongous mess of themselves and and the high chair and everything around them getting more food on the floor than in their face where the baby goes i am so ashamed of how badly i'm eating and how much food i'm getting all over myself they don't feel any shame when they scream and when they throw fits they don't feel ashamed when they keep their parents up all night you know there's never been a baby who has ever looked up at katie in the middle of the night when she had to get up and nurse and the baby looked at my wife's beautiful precious face and said dear mommy i feel so bad that i woke you up again i feel so ashamed that you're not getting as much sleep as you should because i'm screaming my head off and turning purple even though there's absolutely nothing wrong with me (laughs) mother i'm gonna go back to sleep now so that you can rest because i feel so bad about how i've been acting please forgive me you know that's never happened with any of our babies we love our son george george has recently for reasons we don't understand or actually we do because he has a sin nature started biting people we 
are waiting and praying for our son George Mueller to start resembling George Mueller. <laughs> it's a little bit like if I could talk to George, I'd say, George, we gave you this name, one of the godliest men in history, because we expect you to start looking like him. Okay, we want this godliness in you to start at a little, at a younger age. So far, that we've been, that hasn't been happening. This past week, George bit Lydia's finger. If you look at Lydia, she looks like this now. <laughs> I could see George's, so Lydia comes screaming to me, and sometimes kids scream and you're kind of trying to tell whether it's actually serious or not. And so Lydia comes screaming to me, and I could see the bite marks on her finger. It was pretty severe. I'm holding Lydia while she's screaming, and guess who else is screaming? George. George was screaming too. Not because he felt so bad about how much he hurt his sister, but because he wasn't getting what he wanted, which was why he bit Lydia in the first place. So I'm not kidding. We were going over the sermon Thursday night. Noah came up to our room in tears and showed us the place on his back where, Lydia, where George had just bit him. That's how bad. So just pray for our house. There's a lot of people getting bitten, bitten by George. <laughs> Pretty soon we're going to muzzle him. And if you see him and he's muzzled, you know, don't call CPS, just understand we're trying to protect the rest of our family from our ferocious cannibalistic son. So my point is this, babies have no knowledge of good and evil. They don't know right from wrong. This is why they don't feel shame until they are older. And this brings us to the next part of lesson one. The Bible teaches the babies part two are innocent. The Bible teaches the babies part two are innocent. We're gonna, and you can turn to Jeremiah 2. We're going to look at some verses revealing babies' innocence. Most of the verses we'll turn to, but because it was really hard to keep this to one sermon, there's some verses I'm just going to read to you, and you can, they'll be on your bulletins. You can look them up later. So Jeremiah 2, verse 33, the context is God is condemning specifically Jewish harlots. God is condemning Jewish harlots. Jeremiah 2, 33, God says to them, how well you direct your course to seek love. In other words, how hard you work to find men to make money or for business, so that even to wicked women you have taught your ways. They were so bad they could even teach the wickedest women their ways. Now, as you would imagine, pregnancy was one of the regular unwanted consequences for harlots in the ancient world because it's going to bring an end to their business. They don't want to be pregnant, so they frequently had abortions. And God condemned them for this, for murdering their babies. Look in verse 34. On your skirts is found the lifeblood of the guiltless poor. You did not find them breaking in, and I'll explain this. This picture is women murdering their babies, having their blood on their skirts. Now, if I asked you for the worst sin in the Old Testament, and you could not tell me idolatry, what would you say? I would say child sacrifice as well, for those of you who said that. Few, a few common, either way they're murdering their babies, whether they're committing what we would call abortions, ancient world abortions, or whether they were offering their babies to Moloch, which is what a number of commentators said. Here's just a few of them. Ellicott said, the general meaning is clear, and it points to the guilt of Israel in offering her children, the guiltless poor, in horrid sacrifice to Moloch. Matthew Poole said it refers to their, them sacrificing their little children to their idols. Gill's exposition of the entire Bible says it refers to the innocent infants of poor persons who were sacrificed to Moloch. Now, at the end of the verse, when it says, you did not find them breaking in, that's just a way to describe their innocence and say they haven't committed a crime, they have not done anything wrong, they didn't try to rob your house to end up being... Because if someone broke into your house, there's a difference between killing and murdering, right? I mean, God commanded Israel to kill or execute the Canaanites. Saul was to kill or execute the Amalekites, not murder them. There's a, if someone broke into your house and you had to protect your family, then you could kill that intruder, but you wouldn't be murdering that individual. Murder would be what David did to Uriah. So right here, God says they're not breaking in. They didn't do anything to be 
murdered by you. The ESV says the babies were guiltless. Other translations, New King James, NIV, NASB say innocent. Either way, God looks at these babies and he says that they're guiltless or he says that they're innocent. Next, turn to Jeremiah 19. Jeremiah 19, verse 2. God tells Jeremiah, go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom at the entry of the potsherd gate and proclaim there the words that I tell you. The valley of the son of Hinnom, if you're familiar with your Old Testament, you probably already know this is where they sacrificed babies to Moloch. They did this during the days of Ahaz and Manasseh. Briefly look at verse 6 in Jeremiah 19, look at verse 6. God says, therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place, notice this, it shall no longer be called Topheth, or it shall no longer be called the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, but it's going to be called the Valley of Slaughter. Now, just give me your attention. Let me explain this so it's not confusing. Topheth is a location in the Valley of the Son of Hinnom where they would sacrifice the children. So Topheth and the Valley of Hinnom are given the same name at times. The Hebrew word for drum is tof, or T-O-P-H, and more than likely that's how Topheth received its name, because they would beat on these drums to drown out the screams of these children while they were frequently being burned alive to Moloch or sacrificed by the worshipers of Baal. And I just want to make a comment about this. You, one of the more common criticisms that people bring against, the, against God relates to what they perceive to be his cruelty in the Old Testament when judgment was performed against certain nations. Like, for example, here, God is about to describe the judgment that's going to be brought against... Do you see right there it says the valley of slaughter? Let me explain that. It says the valley of slaughter. God says it's no longer going to be called the valley of the son of Hinnom or the valley of Hinnom. It's no longer going to be called Topheth. It's going to be called the valley of slaughter because you Jews are going to be slaughtered there. The Babylonians are going to come in and what you're doing in slaughtering your children is going to, is going to happen to you when the Babylonians slaughter you. The Jews will come to know this valley as the valley of slaughter. So my point is people could look at this the Babylonians executing judgment against the Jews, or, and we can go backward probably a hundred years earlier to when the Assyrians punished the, the Israelites, or 200 years earlier when the Israelites punished the Amalekites, or 700 years earlier when the Israelites punished the Canaanites. These are the more common examples of when God receives criticism for these people being judged or slaughtered. But I just want, I want to ask you this, and I mean this sincerely. It, all of these nations, the Amalekites, the Canaanites, the Israelites were judged when they did it, and the Jews were judged when they did it. Sacrifice children. If sacrificing children would not warrant God's judgment, then what would? What, what could be worse? If, if people are willing to sacrifice their children for their own betterment or their belief that this is going to somehow improve their lives, if people are willing to do that, what could warrant God's judgment any more than that? I can't think of anything. I don't know what could possibly be worse than that. I mean, as a father of nine, to think of individuals who would sacrifice their own children, it's just, it's unfathomable to me. It, to me. It's, it's unimaginable. I mean, you, sometimes people think about you know, the Aztecs, or they think about these people throughout history who have engaged in human sacrifice. If God is just, what would warrant his justice more than this? And I, I, I stand with these judgments and say, amen, Lord. Your justice has been executed against these people who frequently, like the Amalekites or Canaanites, had centuries to repent. There were 430 years that the Israelites were in Egypt before being brought into Canaan. The Amalekites received centuries. The Israelites and Jews were God's people. They, more than anyone else, knew better than to do something this wicked. And so God brings judgment against them, and he's not severe or cruel for doing so. They're willing to murder their own babies. It is no different than abortion today. It is no different than murdering babies today. 
Now, with that in mind, look in verse 4. Jeremiah 19, verse 4. Because the people have forsaken me, have profaned this place by making offerings in it to other gods, place means the promised land, whom neither they nor their fathers nor their kings of Judah have known. And then this is the important part. Because they have filled this place with the blood of innocence. So God doesn't just say that the children who were sacrificed were innocent. He says innocence, plural, because he's describing a category or group who were innocent. All babies are innocent in God's sight. Next, turn to Psalm 106, 34. Psalm 106, verse 34. And while you turn there toward the middle of your Bibles and the poetical books before the, before the prophets, Psalm 106 looks back on Israel's history. We're going to look at the verses about them entering the promised land. Now, if you remember, if you just let this wash over while, you, while you're turning there, God told the Israelites to wipe out the Canaanites, and God warned them, the Israelites, that if they didn't, if they failed to destroy all the Canaanites, they would learn the Canaanites' ways. And did that happen? Yes, that absolutely happened. It happened so much so that the Israelites even began performing the same child sacrifice that the, that the Canaanites had been performing. Look in verse 34. Psalm 106, verse 34. They, the Israelites, they did not destroy the peoples, the Canaanites, as the Lord commanded. Verse 35 but they, the Israelites, mixed with the nations, or the Canaanites, and learned to do what the Canaanites did. Verse 36, the Israelites served their Canaanite idols, which became a snare to them. And then this is it, notice this. Verse 37, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. Verse 38, they poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters. So again, we see God clearly saying that those children who were sacrificed were innocent. Turn to 2 Kings 21. This chapter describes Manasseh's reign. Manasseh, the evilest king in the Old Testament, one, easily one of the easiest, easily one of the evilest, wickedest men to ever live. Just listen to this verse. You don't have to turn there from the parallel account in 2 Chronicles 33. So remember, Chronicles is the Chronicles of Judah, records all the kings of Judah. First and second kings are the annals or the records of the kings of Israel and Judah. Well, the parallel account about Manasseh in 2 Chronicles 33 verse 6 says, Manasseh burned his sons, plural. Manasseh burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He burned them in the place we just read about in Jeremiah. Manasseh didn't sacrifice a son. He sacrificed sons, plural, to Moloch or perhaps to Baal. Now look in 2, Chron excuse me, 2 Kings 21. You turned there, hopefully. Verse 16. Or verse 6, excuse me. I think it's verse 6. Manasseh shed very much innocent blood. Is that 2 Kings 21, 6 or 16? Is that 21, 6? Or is it 16? Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. See, I put my, <laughs> you know, I put my verses in my notes. So you're like, can't he find his place in his Bible? Well, I put my verses in my notes so I don't have to turn around. I, I suspect that I put the wrong place here. So 2 Kings 21, 16. Thank you, Miss Wilcox. It says, moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he filled Jerusalem from one end to the other, besides the other sins that he made Judah sin, so they did evil, and, but you get the point. He sacrificed these children, and God said he was spilling the blood of the innocent. Turn to 1 Kings 14. I have two more accounts to look at. These two accounts don't say babies are innocent, but they do show God's very favorable view of babies. So turn to the left to 1 Kings 14. This is about Jeroboam. So just briefly, Jeroboam was the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, terrified that his people were going to migrate to the southern kingdom of Judah, 
when going to the temple, or he was afraid that he was going to lose people from the northern kingdom when they made their regular trips on the holy days to the southern kingdom of Judah to the temple. So what he does is he sets up these two golden calves, one in the north in Dan, one in the south in Bethel, and the northern kingdom of Israel never recovered from this idolatry that Jeroboam introduced to the nation. So that's the king who's in view here. And what you need to know is because Jeroboam introduced this idolatry into the northern kingdom of Israel, God said, I'm cutting off your line. You are not going to have sons to sit on the throne. Jeroboam had one son, Nadab, that sat on the throne, and then that's it. Basically, the worst punishment that could be given to a king in the Old Testament was this, being told that they will not have sons to sit on the throne. Look in verse 10. 1 Kings 14, verse 10. Therefore, behold, God says, I will bring harm upon the house of Jeroboam. I'll cut off from Jeroboam every male, both bond and free or slave and free in Israel. I'll burn up the house of Jeroboam as a man burns up dung until it is all gone. So God punishes him by cutting off his line not only would Jeroboam's descendants die, they're going to, so when, when God says things like they're going to be burnt up like dung, God uses very crude language. So some people could look at this and say, well, why would God talk so crudely? God talks crudely to show his perception of individuals. And so when you hear him talk this way, it's not a mistake. It, it's not something that someone shouldn't have written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is simply to show God's perception of such a wicked person when you see this sort of uh, crude language. And the, the main point is this. God says that his Jeroboam's sons are going to die in dishonorable ways. They will not be buried with the kings. They're not going to have very honorable, wonderful ends to their lives like the godly kings did. Their lives are going to end the way that basically dung ends up being burnt up. So verse 11. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. Look at that. Anyone who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat. For the Lord has spoken it. What does this mean? This means none of them are going to be buried. This means all of their bodies are going to remain above ground. Now, to the Jewish or Israelite mind, the only faith that's basically worse than death is the lack of burial. And Jeroboam learns that all of his sons will be left above ground in the city for the animals to eat and in the open country for the birds to eat. Now, the interesting part, you say, why am I showing you all this? The interesting part is Jeroboam had a baby. He had an infant son. And my suspicion is Jeroboam was hoping that this son would not die. It's somewhat similar to the situation with David, where David sinned and hoped that his baby would not die. Jeroboam sinned. He hopes his baby will not die. Look in verse 12. God says, Arise, go to your house, and when your feet enter the city, the child shall die. So he did end up dying, but look in verse 13. All Israel shall mourn for him, Jeroboam's baby, and bury him. When none of Jeroboam's other descendants end up being buried, this baby ends up being buried. For he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave or be buried because... In him there is found something pleasing to the Lord, the God of Israel. So even though Jeroboam, all his descendants would be unburied, this child or baby ends up being buried because there's something about him that pleases the Lord. Well, what's going to be pleasing? I mean, when you're a baby, you can't do anything. The baby didn't do anything righteous. The baby didn't sacrifice at the temple or go and do wonderful things that please the Lord. So what pleased the Lord? I'm convinced it was the baby's innocence. I'll share a few more verses with you. You don't have to turn there. Ezekiel was one of the prophets, two prophets along with Daniel, to the exiles in Babylon. So when the Jews were brought into exile, God did not leave them alone there. He sent Daniel and Ezekiel to serve as the two exilic prophets to them. And Ezekiel condemned the Jews for their idolatry that led to their exile in Babylon including sacrificing their children. And just listen to this, Ezekiel 16, verse 20. You took your sons and your daughters whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to idols to be devoured. Were your whorings so small a matter 
that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them. Now, the significant part is in Ezekiel 16, verse 20, God says that the sacrificed children are my children. Now, you know not everyone's a child of God. When the na- you know how when you're mad at your kids, you tell your spouse, you need to get your kids in line, right? That mother who's mad at her kids looks at her husband and says, you, when I, you know, if you come home, if you're a father or husband, you come home and the kids have been terrible, you walk in the door to greet your wife and give her, give her a big hug and a kiss. And she's had like a terrible day, one of those days where your wife calls and says, if, you know, you need to get home now if you want your kids to remain alive kind of thing. And so you walk in the door to hug and kiss your wife and she just looks at you and she's like, your kids have been terrible today. Not, not that Katie's ever done that with me or anything or that's around with my kids. But anyway, your kids are terrible. Well, God did that. He did that with Moses. Whenever the children of Israel were bad, God would tell Moses that they're his people, your children, not my children. What did Jesus tell the religious leaders in his day in John 8? I think verse 44. You're children of the, of the devil. Your, ch- your father is the devil. You are children of the devil. So not everyone's a child of God. But right here we've got God saying that these children who were sacrificed were his children which is essentially an Old Testament way to refer to the elect or the saved. One more example that I'll read to you. Soon after Job's trials began, you might remember it's only in Job 3, that Job expressed desire that he would die at birth to avoid his suffering. Listen to this, Job 3.11. Job says, why did I not die at birth? Why did I not come out from the womb and expire? For then I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept, and then I would have been at rest. Now, I understand that the afterlife was somewhat veiled, not somewhat, the afterlife was veiled in the New Testament, or excuse me, in the Old Testament compared to the revelation given us in the New Testament. And if I asked you, if I said, hey, tell me some verses about the next life, tell me about heaven, tell me about hell, you're going to be going to the New Testament because there's so little in the Old Testament. Mostly the Old Testament talks about the grave, Sheol, or or Hades, right? Well, right here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, even Job recognized that if he was to die as a baby, he would experience peace, rest, Versus, even under the veiled revelation in the Old Testament, he knew the afterlife for babies was not going to be torment and suffering. Instead, it was going to be peace and rest. Now, the last place I want you to turn, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14. Last place to turn this morning, 1 Corinthians 7. Probably a verse I'll look at in the next sermon as well, so you might keep it in mind. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. How, can I just get your attention for a second? If you're, please, if you're ever dealing with a believer who's married to an unbeliever, bring them to this verse. Let the verse speak for themselves. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm shocked. I cannot believe you. the number of times I don't know if it's through email or, or conferences that I receive this question about a believer and an unbeliever being married and whether the believer should divorce or separate from the unbeliever. And I, I don't think I have a huge marriage ministry by any means, but the number of times that I have received this question, and I don't know if people are looking for permission, if they want me If they're a believer married to an unbeliever and they want me to tell them that they can or even should divorce their unbelieving spouse, the greatest potential for that unbelieving spouse to come to salvation is associated with that believer they're living with. And I know that's got to be an incredibly difficult ministry for that believer married to that unbeliever, but it could not be clearer that the believer should remain with that unbeliever. These verses not this verse in particular, but the, ver- the context, the verses around this make abundantly clear. The, the believer is told that if the unbeliever will remain, 
you must remain. You are commanded to remain with that unbeliever. Because what greater potential for them to come to salvation than through seeing Christ through their unbelieving spouse? Now, right here, it says the unbelieving husband is made holy, and I'll explain what that means in a second, because of his wife. The unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, which is the opposite of holy or unholy, but as it is, they are holy. Now, it says that the children of even one, doesn't even have to be both, of even one believing parent are made holy. Now, you know if you've sat under my preaching for very long that holy means separate or set apart. It does not mean saved. It does not mean justified or declared righteous. So to say the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, it just means that that unbelieving husband is set apart for a special work, being an unbeliever married to a believer. And just like these children are made holy or set apart for a special work because they have at least one believing parent. And if you just imagine for a second the Christian influence that a child would receive being in the home with one believing parent, say nothing about two believing parents, versus the lack of influence, or versus being in the home with two unbelieving parents. So it is an incredible blessing for a child or baby to grow up in the home with at least, and I just hope the kids are listening to this, because by, if you're a child and you sit here and you have even one believing parent, you have, by God's grace, been set apart for a holy work from the Lord. You must be incredibly thankful that God has chosen to put you in a Christian home. I mean, if you can sit here this morning and you can hear my voice, you have parents that bring you to church. Do you have any idea how many children don't have that? How blessed you are to have been born into a family where your parents or even one parent would bring you to church to hear God's word preached? And how many children are not afforded that grace? I mean, so please do not ever take that for granted. And so right here, God says that the child of even one believing parent is set apart for this special or holy work. Now, here's what we could very easily think. The children of one believing parent are holy or set apart and by extension, innocent. We could very easily look at these verses and say, well, the children of one believing parent are holy or set apart and by extension innocent. But the children of two unbelieving, unbelieving parents who are not holy or not set apart would not be innocent. In other words, it would be very easy to think that the children of two unbelieving parents would not be holy or set apart or innocent. Now, if we want to talk about the wickedest parents that children could be born to, we actually just read about them. Because the wickedest parents that children could be born to would be those parents who would sacrifice their children to demons. Most of those passages we just read were about the wickedest parents in human history because they were the parents who would sacrifice their children to demons. Yet God still looked at even those children and said that they are innocent. And what's really interesting to me is those babies who were sacrificed, if they were even extended some weeks or months of life, they were around their parents' demonic worship. They experienced some of it. Yet when they were sacrificed, God still looked at those babies and said that they were innocent. They were his children. So my point is, it would be one thing to recognize the children of believing parents are innocent, but we have incredible evidence through those passages we saw that even the children of the worst, most unimaginable, evilest parents we can imagine are still innocent. And I hope it comforts you as it comforts me that when those babies were sacrificed, as horrific as it is to think about, they passed immediately from the torment they experienced in this life to the peace and comfort in the next life. 
I'm sure that's not the same for their wicked parents. And let me conclude with this. Lesson three, babies are innocent, but our other older children are not. Babies are innocent, but our older children are not. I don't know if you know that there's this much of a debate about this. I was listening to John MacArthur one time. He was talking about this panel discussion. He was doing a Q&A, and he's up front with a bunch of other pastors or prominent teachers, I suspect. He didn't tell me their name. He didn't mention their names when he's sharing this in a sermon. But he said he happened to be at the very end, and the question was brought to this panel, what happens to babies when they die? And John said that one person after another on that panel kind of went like this. You know, I don't know. I, I can't answer that for sure. And then it got to John, and he just hammered it, and he said, those babies that die go to heaven. So my point is, it is debatable among some people whether babies go to heaven. It's a very settled issue for me. But for some people, they wonder this. But I can tell you this. One thing that all biblical scholars agree on, I notice I said biblical scholars, we're not including liberal people here or heretics, all biblical scholars agree that our older children are not innocent. And our older children don't all get to go to heaven. It's only those older children who have repented of their sins and put faith in Christ that get to go to heaven. It is only those children, older children, who have repented of their sins and put faith in Christ that get to go to heaven. So if you've lost a baby, I want you to be comforted that that child is in heaven. You'll receive further support for this in the next sermon. But if you have other children, as I do, we don't have, you're with me, we don't have the same guarantee. I don't have that guarantee about my older children. I mean, what what could I want more for eternity than to have my children there with me? I mean, as much as I might love some of you, you're second place to my children, right? (laughs) I mean, as much as I want you in heaven with me, what I want more than anything else is my children in heaven with me. I don't have that guarantee with them. So as parents of older children, we need to do everything we can to support seeing our children saved. This means we need to be praying for our children's salvation. When you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't sleep, pray for your children. Pray for their salvation. And if you're sitting here and you don't have a child in mind, pray for my children. (laughs) Pray for the other children. And you're sitting there and you wake up and you're like, Pastor Scott said, to pray for my children, but I can't even, I prayed for one or two of them, but I don't have any more children to pray for. Pray for the LaPierre children. When you get to the LaPierre children, pray for the Richardson children. Just make sure you put mine in front of theirs. (laughs) (laughs) Preach the gospel to your children. Pray with your children. Let them hear you pray for their salvation. Let them hear your burden for their salvation. Pray aloud for them in the morning or at night for them to be saved. Read the word with your children. Share the gospel with your children. I cannot tell you, I never imagined, I know I've said this before, that I never imagined so many of my Bible studies would end up being the gospel. I'm thinking we're going to go through this passage. It could be Old Testament. And the next thing you know, we're going over the gospel again. And I just want to tell you, anytime you're doing your family worship or family Bible study and you're feeling led to the gospel, don't ever resist that. Go to the gospel. Let that wash over your children. As many times, it might be 20 days in a row of of going over the gospel with your children. Go ahead and make it 21. Faithfully take your children to church, not just so that they hear the word preached, as important as that is, but so they see your faithfulness to the local church. Few things, if any, are going to lead children away from Christ faster than, and hear me when I say this, parents' hypocrisy. Few things will lead children away from Christ faster than hypocritical parents who do not take their relationships with the Lord seriously. We cannot expect our children to rise above our faithfulness. So if we are unfaithful or we do not take our relationships with Christ or with the local church seriously, and there's a strong relationship between those two, how can we expect our children to take their relationship with Christ or with the local church seriously? So don't just bring your children to church so they hear the word, as important as that is. Bring your children to church so they see your faithfulness. 
so they don't think that you're a hypocrite who just talks about it but doesn't live it and can i just say that if you're part of this church family you should feel burdened for the children in this church because you are part of their family or let me say it like this if you're part of this church family the children in this church are part of your family you should be burdened for them pray for their salvation if you have any questions about anything i've shared this morning i'll be up front after service and i'd consider it a privilege to speak with you and i just want to add if you ever have struggles with your children i've been blessed sometimes parents have come up to me and said hey can you pray with me for this child that's always a blessing for me to be able to do that and i know pastor nathan or any of the other elders would say the same father we thank you for the gospel we thank you for the innocence of babies it's it's just horrific it, it's it's uncomfortable to talk about the child sacrifice in the old testament but how blessed we are to know that those babies are innocent in your eyes and that that torment ended and then they found themselves in peace and comfort for eternity lord we thank you so much for that we thank you for the children in this church and we pray for those who have moved beyond the age of innocence or accountability that you'd grant them faith that you'd grant them repentance for for their sin that you would save them that you'd open their hearts for the gospel help us as as parents or grandparents not to tire of praying for our children or grandchildren's salvation sharing the gospel with them few things if any are more important to this church more precious than the children that you've blessed us with I'm, I'm just so thankful for all the children you've given us lord continue to fill this church with children and save them lord we pray for their regeneration we pray that you'd open their hearts to the gospel grant them faith in christ and we ask this in jesus name amen